This week, we are going to talk about addiction and substance-related disorders in nursing. To start off, it's important to understand the terms around substance use and abuse. So to start, addiction is the continued use of a substance or reward-seeking behavior despite adverse consequences. This is important to clarify that there is a difference between an addiction to substances and addiction to certain behaviors. So commonly we think of addiction as being to a substance or a drug, um, but in reality, we can be addicted to other things like gambling, social media, pornography, um, and a bunch of other things as well. Intoxication is a disturbance in behavior or mental functioning during or after alcohol consumption. Withdrawal is the physical and mental symptoms that occur after stopping or reducing the intake of a substance. And I know we've talked a little bit about withdrawal with certain psychotropic medications. Um, so you can actually have withdrawal from um, substances like alcohol or drugs, but you can have it from prescription medications as well. So it's important to understand that. Detoxification is the actual process of removing a toxic substance from your body. So this is mostly done by the liver, but we also call detox the actual process of medical supervision of a patient that's going through withdrawal until that substance is no longer in their body. So detoxing in a medical setting is often much safer. So you'll see patients that are admitted to the hospital for detox and while we're caring for them, we're measuring their withdrawal through a SIWA or a SENA scale, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And that allows us to know how to best treat them, either the withdrawal directly or the symptoms that they're experiencing from the withdrawal. Then we have substance-induced disorders. And this is when medications or substances cause intoxication, withdrawal, or other health-related problems. Whereas a substance abuse disorder is when an individual continues using substances despite cognitive, behavioral, and psychological symptoms. Substance use and abuse reduction is a goal of Healthy People, um, the program that sets certain health goals for the United States each decade. Um, substances can be used by ingestion, smoking, sniffing, or in, um, injection. It can be legal, illegal, or substances used for purposes other than what it's intended. So um, you can have a substance abuse disorder where maybe you're taking a lot of um, laxatives to lose weight. Um, so the laxative would be used for a reason other than what it's intended for. So that could be a substance abuse or substance misuse disorder. Um, you can also develop psychological as well as physical dependence on medications. Um, the most common medications that we typically see dependence on are beta blockers, antidepressants, opioids, and anti-anxiety agents. Um, and the way that it causes dependence is the substance causes brain, a change in the brain circuitry, and that can lead to dependence and addiction, as well as relapse and drug cravings. Um, these brain circuitry changes can be temporary or they can be permanent. So when we talk about assessing someone that has a substance abuse disorder, um, there's a lot of things that we wanna look at. One, we wanna look at any codependence issues. Um, so a lot of times in psychiatric nursing, our patients will have addiction to different substances. It's kind of the chicken or the egg thing. A lot of mental illnesses cause a lot of distressing symptoms. So patients will often turn to um, drugs or alcohol to try and cope with those symptoms. We also know, however, that a lot of substances can cause the onset of symptoms with psychiatric disorders. So in patients, it can be one or the other. There's not any clear cut um, start to the relationship, but we do know that there's a high relationship between mental illness and substance abuse. Um, when we have a patient that has both a substance abuse issue as well as mental illness, we call that codependence or a codependent disorder. 
Um, when we treat a patient that has a mental illness as well as a substance abuse problem, we really need to make sure that we're treating them both at the same time. We wouldn't treat one and then the other or the reverse. They need to be treated together. Um, we also want to assess the type of use. So what substance are they using? There's different questions based on different substances. Um, and there's also different scales, like with alcohol, you have your cage scale um, and a couple of other ones that indicate whether or not the patient has an issue using that substance or if they use it in a more um, healthy way. So when we're doing that, we want to know the frequency of how often they use that substance, the duration, the type, the route, the reason, the amount, the effects that they feel, whether it be related to psychologically, does it increase their risk for hallucinations? Does it increase their risk of depression, suicidal behaviors, homicidal behaviors? We want to assess if there's been any tolerance that has developed or any addiction. We want to assess for any withdrawal symptoms. We could assess how it affects their finances or their relationships with family, friends, coworkers, how it affects their job performance, if it has led to any involvement with the law um, and different things so we get a good understanding of how it's impacting the patient's life. We also want to assess how it affects the safety of others. So if they have um, a dependence on alcohol, are they putting people at risk by driving intoxicated? Does it lead to them making impulsive and risky decisions? Does it lead to increased aggression or maybe self-harm? So we really want to know those other things as well. Does it cause any medical concerns or medical conditions? Is the substance use a result of a medical condition? We also want to assess if they have any denial of the problem or if they have strong motivation for change and good insight. Um, if they do have good insight and a strong motivation to change, that's an ideal time for them to receive treatment. We do want to acknowledge, though, that motivation is fluid and it can be affected by different things like distress, critical life events, um, appraisal and evaluation of their life goals, re recognizing negative consequences, and incentives, both internal and external. So we want to assess for all of those as well. The most important thing that we want to assess when we're talking about substances, though, is how recently did they do the substance? This is going to be especially important with alcohol because there's a certain window where detox often starts. So by knowing when their last use of the substance was can give us a good understanding on when we can start expecting withdrawal symptoms and it can help us create a strong plan of care for that patient. So when we talk about the epidemiology of substance use, we know that in America, alcohol is the most abused substance. However, marijuana is getting up there and is a close second. In adolescence, alcohol use and tobacco use is decreasing while illicit drug use is increasing. Um, part of this is because there is really um, a campaign out there talking about how safe and harmless marijuana is and why that's how it got to um, its legalization and everything. Um, however, we do know that marijuana still can have pretty negative effects for some people, especially patients with mental illness or people that suffer from mental illness or have a family history of it. Marijuana use can actually be quite dangerous. Um, we also know that in the adolescent population, over-the-counter medication is frequently abused. And um, we're finding that substance use is starting to become an issue as early as mm -hmm. middle school. Um, so with that, um, we also see a lot of comorbidities with substance use. Um, I talked about how we really don't know if it leads to mental illness or if mental illness leads to mental, um, to substance abuse. But we do know that substance abuse increases the risk for homicide, opportunistic infections, as well as risk of death. And that's more related to overdose as well as to the risky and impulsive behaviors that a lot of people experience when they're using substances. As far as the etiology of it goes, we do know that there is a genetic component to addiction. Um, 
different things like temperament, self-concept and self-esteem, peer pressure, family and friend relationships can also increase the risk of substance abuse problems. We also know that addiction is higher when people have increased access to substances and it can also be age dependent. So when we talk about treatment and recovery, our goal is to recover from the substance abuse with minimal long-term consequences, as well as to decrease the risk of relapse. So short-term treatment for someone that has a substance abuse disorder would be detox <clears throat> and managing physical symptoms of intoxication and withdrawal. More long-term though, we wanna treat the psychological symptoms because that's gonna be our best way to reduce relapse. So we can do this through therapy. Motivational interviewing is a technique that we use quite often. We can also use brief interventions like the FRAMES framework, which means we're providing feedback, responsibility, advice, a menu of strategies, empathy and self-efficacy when treating the individual so that they can feel more empowered in their treatment and in their um, recovery. Um, we can also um, make sure that we're really using interdisciplinary collaboration when treating someone with a substance abuse disorder because we do know that the more we, we include resources and the more that that patient is the center of that planning, the better outcomes we'll have. We also know that patients are most successful in reaching that point of recovery when they have low levels of dependence or a shorter drug history, if they have a more stable background, if they're exper experiencing few problems with drug use, or if they're unsure or ambivalent about change. Another program that we have for treating substance abuse is 12-step programs. So this is a form of group therapy that provides social support through um, peers that are going through similar experiences. The most commonly known 12-step program is Alcoholics Anonymous or AA. This program specifically assists in spiritual, cognitive, and behavioral components of substance use and recovery. But other examples are Women for Sobriety, Moderation Management, Smart Recovery, Men for Sobriety, um, Narcotics Anonymous or NA. Those are all examples of 12-step programs. 12-step programs are usually led by the individuals in the group and they don't necessarily have to be led by a healthcare provider or a certain group leader. Another treatment that we do with substance abuse is harm reduction. So what harm reduction is, is we reduce the harm of the substance use to that individual or to others, but in a way that they're still using the substance. So we're not treating the addiction at this point. We're not treating their recovery process. We're simply just reducing the harm that that substance use can use. So for example, having a designated driver is a harm reduction strategy. The individuals are still drinking, but they're now not driving. Um, other examples are safe injection rooms. So there are certain places that you can actually go to safely use medications to change out your needles um, and to make sure that you're properly disposing of things. So I don't know if you guys have noticed, but a lot of bathrooms will now have sharps containers. That is a harm reduction strategy to prevent dangerous needles from getting um, accessed by others. Um, other types of therapy that we can use are behavioral therapy, family therapy, um, psychoeducation, CBT, as well as identifying coping skills, things like that. For medications that help with treatment and recovery, um, we can provide certain medications that can curb cravings. So for example, with alcohol, we can provide antabuse or naltrexone. Um, those often deter individuals from drinking alcohol either by curbing the cravings or making them very ill if they combine it with alcohol. Suboxone and methadone are synthetic forms of methadone and heroin. And by providing small doses of the synthetic dose, um, it can curb the cravings. But what they do is since it's a medication that's been created, they give the 
small amounts of the effects to curb the cravings, but they don't actually get the high or the effects that they would have by using the drug. Um, other medications that we can use are benzodiazepines. These are our anti-anxiety medications. We do use this to help patients uh, safely detox from alcohol use. Um, we would never want to use alcohol and benzodiazepines together though, because that has a very high risk for death in that patient. Um, it can lead to things like respiratory depression and overdose. Um, as far as our nursing relationship goes, we always want to avoid counter transference. It's very easy, especially if you have a family member that has had an addiction problem or you've been hurt emotionally or physically by addiction. Um, it's very easy to develop adverse feelings towards your patient, but we always want to remember that we have to treat our patients with respect. We have to treat our patients with dignity despite our own experiences. So it's really important to be self-aware when we're treating someone that has a substance abuse problem. We do want to be aware that our patients may try to be deceitful, manipulative, or hostile depending on the state of their withdrawal and their cravings. We want to avoid any codependence between the nurse and the patient. Um, and a lot of times with codependence, we see this with family members as well. When a patient is codependent on someone else or if that other individual is codependent on them, we often see an increase in enabling behaviors. And so what enabling behaviors are is making excuses or um, using empathy in more of a harmful way to justify that individual's addiction rather than confronting them or helping them to stop it. Um, as far as therapeutic relationships go, we always wanna encourage honesty. We wanna to listen to our patients. We wanna express that we care, but we also wanna hold them responsible for their behaviors. We can do this by confronting them, pointing out any inconsistencies in their thoughts or feelings or actions. Um, we also want to provide fair and consistent consequences for any negative behaviors. Um, and we want to make sure that we're constantly monitoring our own response and our values when working with our patients. Because like I said, we really want to avoid that counter transference. So there are a lot of different substances that are related to substance abuse or commonly addictive. So we'll work through those, but um, the most common things that we see addiction to are alcohol, stimulants, cannabis, hallucinogens, prescription medications, opioids, steroids, sedatives, inhalants, nicotine, and caffeine. Um, so to start off, we'll talk about alcohol. Examples of alcohol are wine, liquor, and beer. And what alcohol does is it relaxes in a inhibitions and heightens the individual's emotions. Um, so it can lead to cognitive impairments by reducing concentration, reducing attention, or impairing an individual's in judgment or memory. It can also lead to mood swings. So what happens is we depress our CNS, which causes mild sedation, relaxation, confusion at times. It can impair our motor function. It can lead to poor speech, um, individuals can develop respiratory failure, they can go into a coma and they can die. Intoxication is determined by their blood alcohol level. So here in the United States, 0.08 is the legal limit. Um, and our body metabolizes one ounce of liquor, five ounces of wine, or 12 ounces of beer per hour without reaching that level of intoxication. So just a general rule of thumb is if you're going out for drinks with your friend um, and you have three beers, you should wait three hours before you drive. Um, we do know that people develop symptoms based on how much alcohol they ingest at a time. So typically one to two drinks will put you at a blood alcohol level of 0.05. At this point, you might feel impaired judgment, giddiness, and mood changes. Five to six drinks can put your alcohol level at 0.1, which is over the legal driving limit. And this can lead to um, difficulty with coordinating movements, and that's why we see a lot of danger in driving. 
10 to 12 drinks puts your blood alcohol level at 0.2. Mm -hmm. At this point, we have motor function that's severely impaired, ataxia, and emotional liability or liability. Um, 15 to 20 drinks puts your blood alcohol level at 0.3, which can lead to stupor, disorientation, and confusion. 20 to 24 drinks can put your blood alcohol level at 0.4. And it, if your blood alcohol level is that high, we often see development of coma-like state. And then 25 drinks or more can lead to respiratory failure and death. One thing to keep in mind though, is as people develop tolerance, their blood alcohol level will still have that same reaction, but they may not experience the symptoms as severely because their body is used to that substance and they've built that tolerance. So as I mentioned before, tolerance is the ability to ingest an increasing amount of alcohol before they increase the effects of it and show the cognitive and motor effects. It is formed from extended and frequent use. Um, and so with that, they can have a high blood alcohol level without the evidence of it physically. There are some um, disorders that alcohol can cause. We call these am amnestic disorders. So this is alcohol-induced atrophy of the frontal cortex, which can lead to chronic brain syndromes like Wernicke's encephalopathy. This is caused from a thiamine deficiency that occurs when drinking. So this can cause vision impairment, ataxia, hypotension, confusion, and the patient can go into a coma. So if you have a patient that comes in for treatment with detox, they're often going to get thiamine supplements to prevent development of this Wernicke's encephalopathy. There's also Korsakoff's amnestic syndrome, and this is a syndrome that affects the heart and vascular system, as well as the nerves. And what happens is the individual develops amnesia. They have a hard time retrieving their memories as well as learning new information. So we see both long-term and short-term memory loss. And because they can't access those memories, they lead to confabulation. And that's when they make up information to try and fill in the blanks that they can't remember. With this, we also see uh, issues with attention. They can have vision impairment as well as disorientation. The last amnestic disorder is Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. And this is when you have both of those combined. Um, so this is a more chronic state of the disorders. With withdrawal, our patients can have very, very severe symptoms and actually withdrawal from alcohol can be deadly. It's one of the only types of withdrawal that you can die from the withdrawal symptoms. So what we see is an increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, diaphoresis, mild anxiety, restlessness, hand tremors, delirium. They can develop uh, seizures as well and eventual death. So with patients that are going through alcohol withdrawal, we would always want to make sure that they're on um, both withdrawal precautions as well as seizure precautions because seizures are very common in alcohol withdrawal. Um, when they develop delirium, it's often a hyperarousal disoriented state where they have increased hallucinations. We do find that alcohol withdrawal generally starts in the first 48 hours after use. So again, that's why it's really important to know when they last use a substance. And they generally complete their withdrawal process within about 96 hours. We do measure their level of withdrawal through a CEWA scale. Um, and based on their CEWA score, lets us know how much medication we can give to safely withdraw them. So we would give a benzodiazepine. It's very similar in its chemical composition to, with, to alcohol. So it allows the patient to withdraw safely. Um, and so, like I said, based on their CEWA score, lets us know what dose of that benzodiazepine that they um, can receive. Um, Librium and Valium, are generally recommended for alcohol withdrawal because it has a smoother taper and they have longer half-lives, so it works a little bit longer. However, Ativan is more commonly used, especially with older adults, because it's a little bit safer on the liver. Um, as far as other medications we can give to treat alcohol withdrawal, if our patient is experiencing delirium or hallucinations, we can give antipsychotics, as I mentioned, we'll give them thiamine supplements as well as other multivitamins and other vitamins. 
we can give them magnesium sulfate. This specifically reduces their risk of seizures. And depending on how severe the individual's withdrawal is, it can either be given in pill form, injection form, or IV. Um, a lot of our patients will also be put on a banana bag, which is a specific um, blend of electrolytes and vitamins for our patients specifically going through alcohol withdrawal. When we're assessing our patients' um, dependence on alcohol, we can use the CAGE questionnaire. This is a self-report questionnaire and it goes through questions like, do you ever feel the need to cut back on drinking? Have others advised you to cut back? Do you feel guilty in your drinking behaviors? And do you have early morning drinking? Technically, if our patients answer yes to any of those, they would have a positive CAGE assessment and we would wanna go more in depth in assessing their use and possibly treating addiction. Um, and then we talked about um, some medications that we can use to help promote um, recovery and prevent relapse. Like I mentioned, antabuse is one of those. Antabuse does cause significant vomiting when mixed with even small amounts of alcohol. Um, so it can deter people from drinking alcohol because the side effects when mixing are so severe and it can actually cause death. It can lead to respiratory depression, um, a heart attack, arrhythmias, cardiovascular collapse, CHF, convulsions, and eventual death. Whereas naltrexone just reduces the cravings and helps to maintain abstinence. Um, other relapse prevention strategies could be the different types of therapy that we talked about, as well as taking vitamins, educating them on the consequences, and adjusting any of their psychosocial complications of withdrawal. Stimulants are another type of medication. Um, it's usually categorized as cocaine, amphetamines, or MDMA or club drugs. So cocaine can be snorted, injected with water, or smoked. Um, crack cocaine is another example of cocaine, and this is when they mix cocaine with water and baking soda or sodium bicarbonate, and they boil it until it crystallizes. Then they break up those crystals and smoke it. This is often cheaper and it gives a more rapid high with more intense euphoria, but they also have a more dramatic crash. Um, crack cocaine is often much more addictive and causes greater cravings and it can lead to a, a more severe long-term effects. Cocaine and crack cocaine are absorbed through the blood-brain barrier, the skin and mucous membranes. And the way that it works is it increases both dopamine and serotonin activity. Um, one negative effect of that is that it increases the dopamine and serotonin to a high enough level that it causes tolerance. So the individual has a harder time processing their dopamine and serotonin, so it can lead to long-term effects of depression. There are different symptoms that you experience with cocaine use. In the first 20 minutes, you would have mental alertness and energy more self-confidence, you may feel more in control, more social, um, very euphoric. You can also have increased psychotic symptoms like hallucinations. And then within two minutes after that, you enter the letdown stage. And this is when you're often irritable, depressed, tired, you start to crave the drug. It can lead to panic attacks as that serotonin and dopamine levels drop so quickly. Um, and that can also lead to sleep disturbances as well as anorexia. Um, it can also increase our norepinephrine in the blood, which can cause tachycardia, hypertension, dilated pupils, and increased body temperature. So when we talk about the symptoms of intoxication with cocaine, we would identify tremors, agitation, possible convulsions, CNS depression, and death that can occur from respiratory failure would be a symptom of overdose. We can see psychosis, tachycardia, hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias, sweating, hyperreflexia, and convulsions. Um, we often see too that mixing cocaine and alcohol can lead to very severe um, respiratory depression, symptoms of death, as well as um, overdose. Symptoms of withdrawal from cocaine are anxiety, 
restlessness, and agitation. We see intense cravings and depression that can last for weeks and often contributes to relapse. Individuals will sleep about 12 to 18 hours after use due to decreased dopamine levels. And we also see a disturbance in the REM sleep cycle. The individual can lack energy and libido. They can develop suicidal thoughts and depression, as well as anhedonia and poor concentration. Cocaine is the second most illegally trafficked drug in the world, and it's used by over 35.3 million indiv individuals in America that are over the age of 12. About 8.5 high schoolers use cocaine, and it's the second most common drug used in Europe. Amphetamines are often called things like speed, uppers, ups, black beauties, pop pills, and cock pilot. Examples of amphetamines are Ritalin, Preludin, and other stimulants. It acts on both the CNS as well as the peripheral nervous system. It is legally used to treat ADHD, narcolepsy, depression, and obesity because it can increase alertness, concentration, energy, and euphoria, and it's also used as an appetite suppression. So it works by reducing newly produced norepinephrine while blocking the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. So it can lead to overdose um, if you take too much of it, and overdose would cause tachycardia, arrhythmias, increased blood pressure, um, and peripheral hyperthermia. The withdrawal symptoms are the same as with cocaine, and this is the most commonly um, prescribed medication that's abused. It's especially abused by students because it helps them to focus in while they're studying for tests or um, writing a paper and so on and so forth. Methamphetamine is also called meth, speed, ice, chalk, crank, fire, glass, and crystal. And the way that it works is it releases excess dopamine and serotonin. It can be smoked, snorted, or orally ingested or injected. It causes a rush unless it's ingested. It is very cheap and easy to make and it lasts a little bit longer than cocaine. There are pretty severe side effects to methamphetamine use, such as elevated body temperature, which can cause seizures. Um, it is one of the most highly addictive and dependent substances, so tolerance occurs within minutes. Um, it can cause hallucinations and delusions, especially paranoia. It can lead to mood disturbances, repetitive motor activity, stroke, weight loss, and tooth decay. MDMA or club drugs are ecstasy, ketamine, and molly. And the way that they work is they release serotonin in greater amounts than usual. So the receptors are more excessively activated. Um, dopamine is also excessively or released. However, what happens with this is while it releases that large amount of serotonin, it causes serotonin containing neurons to be destroyed. So once you do any of these um, MDMA or club drugs, your capacity to produce and use serotonin is reduced each time you use it. So after the first use of these club drugs, you'll never be able to find that same level of serotonin that you had had prior. Um, the effects of these is it can cause hallucinations, confusion, depression, sleep problems, craving, severe anxiety, and paranoia. Overdose of these drugs cause muscle breakdown, which can increase body temperature very quickly, leading to hyperthermia, kidney and co cardiovascular failure, as well as death. It can lead to numbness, delirium, depression, respiratory depression, and cardiac arrest. Um, as far as nursing considerations go for these drugs is it can be injected unknowingly, um, which can cause euphoria and a sedative-like effect, as well as anterograde amnesia, meaning that you don't remember anything um, that happened after taking it. So these are commonly used as like date rate drugs or um, if you're trying to harm or injure someone and it can be slipped into drinks very easily. Um, and the individuals usually don't remember what happened. So it can be very dangerous. Um, they do have some pretty unique and cool things out there to prevent your drinks from being spiked. Also, there's some nail polish that you can buy that if you um, put your nail in the drink, it'll change a color if 
someone has spiked that drink with a club drug. Um, so ketamine is an, also a medication that we use with anesthesia sometimes um, because it can cause sedation, pain relief. Um, that is helpful with things like removing your wisdom teeth, but it can also cause an increase in heart rate and blood pressure, as well as impaired motor function, vomiting. It increases fall risk. So if we are giving it to a patient for anesthesia, they would need to have telemetry and frequent monitoring of vitals. Other stimulants are nicotine and caffeine. So for nicotine, we know that about 20% of the population uses nicotine, um, where individuals with a mental illness is a much higher percentage. We find 36% of people with mental illness use nicotine. Um, it can be chewed, smoked, um, or through a transdermal patch. If, we, if an individual does use chew, we would want to educate them that a lot of times chew contains glass so that it causes small cuts in your mouth so that the nicotine is more effectively absorbed and it can be more addictive. Um, so that's a very dangerous thing. If it's smoked, um, we want to educate them that cigarettes are filled with toxic substances. They may use e-cigarettes because they feel that it's safer, but technically e-cigarettes are not FDA regulated. So it can, the individuals can lie about what's actually in it as well as the level of nicotine in it. And we also know that e-cigarettes have a lot of synthetic chemicals to create the different flavoring and it can actually have very, very, very severe effects on lungs as well. Um, another way that you can smoke it is through hookah. The biological response to nicotine is that it stimulates the central, peripheral, and autonomic nervous system, which increases a release of norepinephrine and acetylcholine. This then causes increased alertness, increased concentration, attention, and it can suppress your appetite. Um, the negative effects of using nicotine is it can increase the risk of arterial sclerosis, peripheral vascular disease, as well as cardiac mu muscle pathologies. For respiratory problems, it leads to emphysema, lung cancer, and it is the largest preventable cause of premature death in the U.S. We often find that nicotine use is comorbid with alcohol use, polysubstance abuse, and mental health disorders. We do find that individuals that have a mental health disorder often have a life expectancy of about 10 less compared to the general population. And there's a lot of speculation that it's actually due to the increased levels of nicotine that are used by individuals with mental illness. Um, withdrawal symptoms can be mood changes, cravings, anxiety, irritability, and depression. They can also develop difficulty concentrating, sleep disturbances, headaches, gastric distress, and increased appetite. When we're treating a patient that has nicotine abuse in the hospital, we can use nicotine replacement therapy. So this is giving them nicotine in forms that are less harmful than smoking or chewing, and it's smaller amounts so it can help them safely withdraw from the substances. So the different ways that we can provide nicotine replacement therapy is through an inhaler or a nasal spray, although this is not very commonly used. More often what we'll see is the nicotine patch. The nicotine patch does take about two hours before it starts um, affecting the body. So we would want to educate our patients on that. And really best practice is to provide a nicotine patch and then a nicotine gum. So they get that immediate nicotine release to hold them over for about two hours until the nicotine patch starts working. With the nicotine patch, it is transdermal. So it can be anywhere on the skin above the foot. The most common places are the shoulder, back, or chest because it just tends to stick there a little bit better. We do want to make sure that we are um, rotating sites because it'll help the absorption better. And it can cause severe nightmares. So if our patient does have a nicotine patch, we would want to educate them to take it off before bed. Nicotine gum is another form of nicotine replacement therapy and it's given every two to four hours. Um, and the way that you would want to educate your patients to use it is they chew a few times and then they should pocket it in their cheek and suck on it. And then they can chew, pocket it on the other cheek and suck on it. Um, and like I said, this is really effective to help curve cravings, especially right when the patch is put on. Other measures to decrease alcohol use is through 
um, social support. So there is a website call, or I'm sorry, a phone number. It's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. This can help provide support for individuals that want to quit smoking. It can also provide free nicotine patches and gum give education, advice, and resources to help quitting. As far as education goes, the benefits of quitting smoking are pretty staggering. So within two hours of quitting smoking, your blood pressure and temperature can return to normal. Within four hours, your carbon monoxide levels inside your body return to normal. Within eight hours, any GI issues can resolve. Within 24 hours, your chance of having a heart attack decreases and it actually returns to normal after quitting for one full year. Um, 72 hours after quitting, your exercise tolerance and lung capacity improves. Within nine months of quitting, your chance of developing bronchitis decreases. Within 10 years of quitting smoking, your risk of developing cancer and heart disease decreases. Um, and we do know that quitting smoking can decrease anxiety and depression as effectively as an antidepressant. We do know that just talking to our patients for two minutes in the hospital can increase their chances of quitting significantly. Um, and patients are most motivated to quit smoking when they're in the hospital. So it's really important that we take advantage of that and do our smoking cessation education for our patients. It does take an average person five times to quit smoking. And we want to encourage them to use different methods than what they've previously tried. Um, another effective technique in educating patients on how to quit smoking is calculating the cost of how much money they're spending on cigarettes and how much they could save if they cut that out. We can also provide medications that can help curb um, nicotine cravings. So for example, Wellbutrin, as an antidepressant that can um, help people quit smoking. When we use it to quit smoking, we call it Zyban. Also Chantix is another antidepressant that can reduce cravings by preventing nicotine from accessing acetylcholine receptors. And that can often lead to depression and psychosis. So when we provide that, um, the individual has decreased smoking um, cravings as well. Um, it is counterindicated in individuals that have a current mental illness outside of depression. Other forms of treatment we can use is ear acupuncture therapy. That's not commonly done in the hospital, but we can refer our patients to that outpatient. And what it does is it stimulates pressure in the ear to increase endogenous endorphin levels that can lead to better regulation of body symptoms, reduce cravings, and reduce withdrawal effects. And then lastly, some people will use hypnosis to help quit smoking. Caffeine is the last stimulant I want to talk about. Examples of caffeine are used in energy drinks, coffee, pop, tea, chocolate, and some over-the-counter medications. Um, it is considered a stimulant, an appetite suppressant, an analgesic, and it can um, also be used to treat colds. It increases energy. Intoxication of caffeine causes restlessness, nervousness, excitement, insomnia, flushed face, diuresis, GI disturbances, muscle twitches, rambling and flow of thoughts in speech, tachycardia, cardiac arrhythmias, inexhaustibility and psychomotor agitation. Withdrawal from caffeine can cause headaches, drowsiness, fatigue, impaired psychomotor performance, difficulty concentrating, increased cravings, psychophysiological complaints, yawning, and nausea. So nursing considerations for caffeine is it is very highly addictive. And in the future, they're talking about regulating it per ages and making it um, kind of like alcohol where you have to be 18 or older to drink anything with caffeine. Um, and it can interfere with a lot of psychiatric medications. And the way it interferes with it is it can inactivate it. So in a psychiatric hospital, oftentimes they'll have um, decaffeinated coffee and the patients can't have any caffeine. Next, I wanna talk about cannabis. Um, examples of cannabis are spice and marijuana. This is a fat soluble and absorbed rapidly substance. It can be smoked or ingested. And what it does is it engages endogenous brain opioid receptors to increase dopamine activity. Um, the effects of marijuana use 
Short term is psychologically, it can cause relaxation, euphoria, dyschoria, which is abnormal pupil shapes and reaction, spatial misrepresentation, time disorientation, food crazy cravings, drowsiness, and decreased motivation. It can also cause paranoia, anxiety, and psychosis, especially as it increases that dopamine level, it can cause severe hallucinations. It can alter judgment and cause poor decision-making. Um, physically, it can reduce any nausea and pain, especially caused by chemotherapy, so we do use it um, medically. Um, generally, if we use it medically, we put it in a pill form and it's called Marinol. And what it does is they actually remove the hallucinogenic portion of marijuana and just provide the individual with the component of marijuana that has medical benefits. So there's less long-term consequences of using Marinol versus marijuana. Long-term, what happens is accumulation of cannabinoids can develop in the body especially in the frontal cortex and limbic area. So it can cause long-term damage to both hearing and visual perception. It can also contribute to schizophrenia. So if we find that cannabis use is the biggest trigger for a psychotic break in individuals with both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, it can cause long-term heart effects and ataxia. It can impair our ability to form memories, recall events and shift our attention. It can cause long-term effects of coordination, balance, and reaction time. It can contribute to lung cancer, and it is addictive, despite a lot of common misconception that you can't be addicted to marijuana. We do find that you can overdose on marijuana, and you can also have um, withdrawal symptoms when stopping it. Then we have hallucinogens. So hallucinogens cause a psychological effect of producing euphoria, dysphoria, altered body image, disorientation or sharpened visual and auditory perceptions, confusion, lack of coordination, impaired judgment and memory, as well as intense mood, intense sex or increased sexual behaviors, um, as well as it can cause someone to become more isolative and distant. Biologically, we see an increased heart rate, increased body temperature, increased blood pressure, dry mouth, and dizziness. Examples of hallucinogens include mushrooms, LSD, PCP, mescaline, um, and amphetamine derivatives. Immediate treatment for someone that is taking a hallucinogen is to reduce their stimuli, help them to maintain a safe environment, manage any behaviors, and treat any medical complications. Long-term therapy is we or long-term treatment is we would want to provide therapy, sobriety, and prevent relapse. For over-the-counter and prescription medications, um, we have to do a thorough assessment to consider when abuse is occurring. So we consider it abusive when they take the medication prescribed to somebody else. If they take the medication in higher quantity than what's prescribed or if they take the medication for a purpose other than why it's prescribed. The most commonly abused over-the-counter medications are opioids, stimulants, and benzodiazepines. Um, and these are used for pain medications, anti-anxiety, or ADHD. We also know that cough syrup is commonly misused because it causes the same effects as ketamine or PCP. By impairing motor functioning, it can cause numbness, nausea or vomiting, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, hypoxia, and respiratory depression. For opioids, these can be sniffed, snorted, injected, smoked, or ingested. The way it works is it binds to opioid receptors to produce an agonist action, so it increases the dop dopamine release, causing a rush. It is derived from poppies. Um, examples are opium, heroin, which is the most commonly abused, morphine and codeine. Biological effects of it is it can cause CNS depression, increased need for sleep and stupor, flushing of the skin, dry mouth, nausea and vomiting, itching, a heavy feeling in the limbs, and a slowed heart rate. Um, it can also slow the breathing rate so it can lead to respiratory depression. Psychologically, it can cause mental clouding, reduce pain, and it does activate our reward center. 
Generally, it doesn't cause addiction when prescribed, only when it's used improperly. I have put a lot of videos in the um, weekly module that talk about the different ways that the opioid pandemic and epidemic have developed and how it really was caused by a lot of misinformation by the drug companies indicating that it was safe to take in certain amounts. Um, so those are very interesting to take a look at and I recommend watching those to better understand how the opioid epidemic has occurred. As far as nursing considerations go, um, you can overdose. It's often treated with Narcan, which is an opioid antagonist. The Narcan begins working within two minutes and you can give multiple doses if it doesn't work. Generally, Narcan can be injected or inhaled. Um, a lot of times opioids when used recreationally are cut with other substances. Um, generally it's cut with sugar, starch, powdered milk, and quinine, but they can also be cut with poisons and fentanyl, which makes them extremely deadly. If our patients inject our, their opioids, it can increase risk of HIV and other bloodborne pathogens from sharing needles. It is highly addictive, and if someone is addictive, we want to make sure that they have good social support, a stable living environment, um, and we want to assess how it impacts work, finances, and family relationships. The patient can go through detox and withdrawal. Um, the way that we treat detox is we want to gradually reduce the opioid use and provide medication substitutes that satisfy the craving without giving the high. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Examples are methadone. Um, so methadone can sl slowly be reduced within 21 days um, to help reduce cravings of um, different opioids. If it is used more long-term, the patient would have to go to a methadone clinic every morning or a couple times a week to receive that medication. When we provide methadone or Suboxone, so Suboxone is used specifically to lower the risk of abuse for methadone, um, if we use either of those, we want to make sure that we're combining that treatment with therapy on lifestyle changes. We want to encourage them to surround themselves with individuals who don't use that drug because that can be a trigger for relapse. We want to help provide a stable living situation, strengthen their social support, and help them pursue interest. Um, symptoms of withdrawal from opioids include body aches, diarrhea, tachycardia, fever, runny nose, sneezing, sweating, yawning, nausea or vomiting, nervousness, restlessness or irritability, shivering and trembling, abdominal cramping, weakness, and elevated blood pressure. Op opioid withdrawal is not deadly like alcohol withdrawal is. We still measure it on a withdrawal scale, which is the SENA scale. And the, basically what the SENA scale does is it helps us to identify the symptoms of withdrawal so that we can treat them symptomatically. So our medications that we're going to use to treat this is going to be things like Imodium if they're having diarrhea, um, Ibuprofen if they're having abdominal cramps, um, if they're having um, a runny nose, we might provide them with um, Claritin or something. Um, Another thing that I want to point out with opioid withdrawal, we often do not see seizures like we do with alcohol withdrawal. As far as our inhalants go, these are organic solvents that depress the central nervous system. They're inhaled. Biologically, it can cause sedation, respiratory depression, stupor, coma, lightheadedness, hallucinations, and delusions. Psychosocially, it can cause emotional lability, euphoria, impaired judgment, and it is similar to alcohol. It can also increase sexual pleasure. There are different types of inhalants. So volatile solvents are liquids that vaporize at room temperature. So for example, paint thinners, paint removers, degreasers, cleaning fluids, felt tip markers, contact cleaners, glue, gasoline, and lighter fluids are all volatile solvents. We also have our aerosols, which are propellants and solvents. So the examples of aerosols are spray paint, hairspray, fabric protectors, aerosol computer cleaners, vegetable oil sprays, asthma, deodorants, air fresheners, and analgesics. Then we have our gases. 
which include um, different gases that you can inhale. And then we have our nitrates. So nitrates are whippets and poppers. Whippets contain nitrous oxide and those can be inhaled as well. Um, symptoms of intoxication from inhalants is confusion, perceptual disorientations, severe CNS depression, arrhythmias and cardiac arrest, and it can cause mild impairment of the brain as all the way up to severe dementia. So it worsens the working memory and decreases the individual's ability to focus, be attentive, plan, and problem solve. Another severe risk factor with the use of inhalants is sudden sniffing syndrome. And this occurs when the fumes from the inhalants replaces oxygen in the lungs, which causes suffocation. And that can be caused from a one-time use or frequent use. Then we have our steroids. Anabolic steroids are synthetic substances that produce androgens or male sex hormones. It is used to medically treat things like hypogonadism, delayed puberty, impotence, and um, wasting of the body and the muscles in patients that have HIV. So it can help with muscle growth and development of male sex characteristics. It's usually orally or injected. Um, it can also be applied to the skin as a cream or a gel. Long-term risks of taking steroids is it can increase irritability and aggression. It can increase the need for physical fighting, armed robbery, use of force to obtain something, property damage, theft, and breaking and entering. It can cause euphoria and increased energy. It can cause increased sexual arousal. Um, while it does that, it can decrease libido. It reduces sperm production. It can shrink the testicles and it can cause breast enlargement in males. It can lead to mood swings as well as distractibility, forgetfulness, and confusion. It can increase the risk for heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, cholesterol changes, and hypertension. It can be used as a muscle suppressant and to treat any muscle and joint pain. It can cause liver cancer or liver failure as well as cancer. It can lead to difficulty and pain with urination, hair loss, and acne. Then we have our emerging drug trends. So these are um, increasing in popularity and increasing in use, and they're generally synthetic forms of drugs. Whenever we have a synthetic form of a drug, it's often much more um, severe in its effects as well as its consequences and its addiction abilities. So one example is bath salts. Bath salts is synthetic cathinone, it's similar to methamphetamines and MDMA, so it causes euphoria, increased social ability, increased sex drive, paranoia, agitation, hallucinations, delirium, cardiac arrest, high blood pressure, insomnia, chest pain, and it can increase risk of assault and suicide. It is highly abusive and is common among college students. Crocodile is a form of desomorphine, which is made by combining codeine tablets with toxic chemicals like lighter fluid and industrial cleaners. It's often used as a cheap alternative to heroin. It can lead to changes in personality. It can impair memory and concentration, poor speech, and motor skill impairments. And what it does is when it's injected, it can cause severe sores, ulcer, gangrene, and flesh and muscle decay in that area. So the individual develops like a gray, green, dead, scaly skin at the injection sites, and it can actually act almost like a flesh-eating bacteria where it will destroy the muscle in the um, skin and it can expose bone. It can be quite severe in its skin effects. It does lead to a quick death as well. Then we have NBOM or SMILES, which are synthetic hallucinogens that are used as substitutes for LSD. The negative consequences of this is it can cause seizures, heart attacks, respiratory arrest, paranoia and panic attacks, nausea and vomiting, arrhythmias, and death. Then we have our non-substance related addictive disorders. So you can be addicted to gambling, pornography, food, video games, sex, shopping, relationships, internet and computer use, and so on. And what we find is that addiction to non-substance related um, 
things often follows a cycle. So this cycle is when the individual engages in the activity. Then while they're engaging in the activity, they feel relief and a sense of control, enjoyment. And then after the activity, they experience dissatisfaction. So they often feel guilt and shame. And then they enter the stage of moral resolve and bargaining. They promise to get better, they make amends, and then the pain returns. When the pain returns, the individual may feel disillusioned and desperate. And in that desperation, they demand a relief. So it leads to them feeling angry and entitled, entitled to have something or to engage in that activity. So it leads to them engaging in that act, addictive activity and then the cycle continues. One of the main um, concerns as far as addictive disorders go is gambling. So gambling disorder is diagnosed through preoccupation with gambling experience and arousal. It can cause a euphoric state during betting. Um, and it's more common in individuals that develop that rush and that arousal than individuals that actually want to win money. So the phases of a gambling addiction is they win, then they lose, then they become desperate, and then they can become hopeless. And then that hopelessness leads to them craving the win again, so they go back to the um, behavior. We do find that gambling addiction is more common in individuals that are highly competitive, energetic, restless, or easily bored. It is more common in, to, in males and one to 3% of the population have it. Gambling addiction can lead to higher suicide rates through both lifestyle changes as well as the um, isolation of losing relationships, the fear after they lose money, um, they are also less likely to seek treatment. We also find that people with a gambling addiction have a comorbid nicotine or alcohol dependence. It can also lead to depression, ADHD, um, and it can be comorbid with Tourette syndrome, personality disorders, and other mental illness. For treatments, there are Gamblers Anonymous. We also want to confront any beliefs that they can easily win back what they've lost because that is often a form of self-deception as well as denial. We would wanna treat any effects that it's had on their family or friend relationships. We would wanna assess their finances, identify any poor job performances, treat any substance use and comorbidities, and we would want to prevent relapse. So we would want to learn specific cues that trigger their gambling behaviors and make sure that we are helping to reduce those triggers. Lastly, I wanna talk about nurses and chemical dependence. Nurses are at high risk for substance abuse due to easy accessibility, especially to prescription medications. They also have training and administration of medications. So they're familiar with the medications. They understand the mechanism of action. They know appropriate do doses, drug to drug interactions, and how to use it more safely. They also have greater knowledge on how to treat withdrawal and overdose. So that combined with the stress of nursing due to staffing shortages, patient demands, working longer than eight hour shifts, having shift rotations, increased overtime, difficult working conditions, and possible poor worker relationships all increase nurses' risk of developing a substance abuse disorder. Nurses are often very reluctant to seek health. Um, and so it's really important that we encourage nurses to not feel ashamed by it and to seek the help that they need. We do know that in nurses that abuse, they can have impaired coworker relations. They can engage in bullying behaviors. They often shift responsibilities. They um, can compromise patient safety through poor judgment and decision-making, delayed reaction time, slower completion of tasks. And so it's important that we intervene early and recognize any nurses that may have a problem as this can reduce hazards to patients. We would want to increase prospects for that nurse's recovery. And we have a law in place that nurses that have a substance abuse disorder cannot be fired for that substance abuse disorder because we have to offer them treatment first. They can be fired for things like stealing medications or engaging in bullying behavior, behaviors or other grounds for firing, 
But if the individual is willing to um, attend a treatment facility, we technically have to save that job for them. We can also provide free counseling to nurses through the employee assistance program. So signs of substance abuse in nurses is that they can have inappropriate behaviors at work, such as manipulation, aggressiveness and assaultive behaviors. They may be sexually inappropriate. They may take frequent days off, be non-compliant with policies and procedures. They can have deteriorating job performance, sloppy or illegible charting, charting errors, deteriorating appearance, you may smell alcohol on their breath. They may have increased forgetfulness, poor judgment, poor concentration. They may frequently lie or volunteer to be the medication nurse if there's a medication nurse on the unit. Um, they may have frequent miscounts in the Pixis or the med dispensing machine. Um, they could possibly um, pocket PO medications and only provide the patient with IM medications. They may give the partial dose or not waste medications properly. Um, and personality types that are highly correlated with substance abuse in nurses are they often are high achievers, they may volunteer for overtime and extra responsibilities, they often use limited medications for other illnesses, and they may have a family history of alcoholism or addiction. And that is our lecture on addiction and substance abuse in nursing.